Okay. Hi, Kevin. Hey, Stella. How's it going? I'm good. Hey, Kevin, thank you for agreeing to talk to us today. Um, of course, happy. I, want, I wanted to start by asking you um, to go right back to the beginning, right back, right back to the first time that you remember ever hearing about Fanconi anemia. What happened then? So my son was born, uh, when he was born, he was, he was quite small, had a couple anomalies, uh, kind of funky thumbs, small head. We were working the genesis for quite some time. They would given us a bunch of different ideas, different things, but we got a letter once. Uh, I was at work, my wife called me, and we got a letter from the geneticist saying, you should check out Fanconi anemia. And so I certainly, I was at work, I Googled it up and looked at it, and I knew once I saw it, all the different symptoms that Sean was a perfect fit. So that was, that was about just before his first birthday. How did that diagnosis make you feel? Well, as you might imagine, it was, uh, it was quite a, sh well, it was quite a shock. We knew he had something, we weren't quite sure what it was. Um, and just to, back in the day when he was, you know, roughly uh, 20 some odd years ago, an FA diagnosis was really, it's never a great, it's not a good thing now, but it was really dire back then. So it really uh, obviously turned our lives upside down. I, I kind of, uh, the analogy I use is like if you get tumbled by a wave and you just don't know what side's up for a while. So it took us probably six, seven months just to kind of figure out what, what, what was going on. Um, and then, you know, we kind of, kind of resolved to fight it. And uh, that's when we got involved in FARF and other things. So it was six or seven months to resolve it. How, how did you do that? What sort of resources were helpful to you? Uh, we, again, we connected with FARF relatively early on, spoke to a lot of families, uh, realized that the FA diagnosis, the course can be a little bit different, um, gave us a little bit of hope, really got involved in fundraising, just learned as much as we possibly could, um, and just resolved to never not have any Talking to a lot of the families, people talked about um, having no regrets. And my wife and I decided we're going to do everything possible uh, to have no regrets and do everything we can to, to give Sean the best life, the longest life we possibly can. For any, any kid with FA and their family, that first 10 years is often dominated by watching the counts and thinking, am I going to need a bone marrow transplant? Where would a donor be? What will it be like? How was that for you? Scary. Every, every blood draw, every bone marrow biopsy, you're always waiting for that shoe to drop. Um, uh, we, were mar we were watching Sean's counts and they were kind of steadily declining. Um, we talked to a couple, we went to Minnesota, talked to a couple of transplanters and we kind of said, hey, can we predict? And we thought, um, you know, based on what they, what they saw, maybe in a couple of years he might be ready for transplant. Uh, fortunately for us, Sean's counts sort of leveled off in his uh, 12, 13, early teens, and have been pretty steady since. But it's uh, it was still something we still get anxious when we do the, the quarterly blood draws and, and the annual bone marrow biopsy. So it's just, it's something that's always there um, in the back of your mind. So Sean was one when he was diagnosed. So you, you and Lorraine were carrying the burden of worrying and thinking about it for him. But as the children get older, you need to talk to them about it. How did you handle that? Part of it was we went to camp, we, you know, we got involved in FARF, we went to camp, really, I guess Sean won he, when he was two. Um, so that provided some opportunities for him to just get exposed and meet other kids. And it maybe, although he wasn't, you know, learning about the science at the time, it gave us a forum to talk about different piece, different things, different aspects of it. Um, so when we went to camp, we talked about it. And just over time, it just, it just kind of felt natural. Uh, as he got older, got more mature, we could talk about different subjects. So it wasn't like we had one conversation, just kind of naturally evolved. But because he was involved from as early as he can remember, it's just been part of his life. Do you think it worried him? Or did, were you able to do the worrying for him? <laughs> uh, if you know Sean, he's, uh, he's considered by many people the most chill and uh, unflappable <laughs> person in the entire world. Um, so... You know, we're blessed in the sense that he's not, it's not something that, that, that bothers him deeply, uh, it troubles him. He he's doesn't, uh, he kind of lives the day, doesn't think a lot about the future in depth. Um, and uh, so it's, a, and in some ways it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword, but for us, it's, it's worked out well. He hasn't, uh, hasn't troubled him uh, a lot. And he, he knows about it, he knows what's happened, but it's not something that he dwells on. So for, for quite a lot of years, things went a lot more smoothly than you probably thought right back when Sean was diagnosed. 
and that takes us up to December of 2018. What, what happened then? So uh, my wife and I were going to our uh, company holiday party um, and we were on our way and uh, Sean, despite being five feet tall, um, played on his high school basketball team. He's got a great outside shot. And uh, that was the only game we hadn't gone to because it was the holiday party and it was a game that night. And uh, we were driving there with another couple and both our fur phones started lighting up. People started calling our phones. Like, That's weird. Um, and Sean was warming up for the basketball game and doing layups and someone bumped him and he fell down and he couldn't get up. Um, and they were able to pull him over to the side, pick, you know, put it, send him a chair. And after about 10 minutes, he kind of snapped back into it. There was a doctor there that we know that checked his eyes out and did different things. Uh, and they said, he's okay. He's fine. Um, but our friends were very, they were, you can tell in their voice, something was not quite right. He didn't look quite right. So we turned around, went home, a friend of our brought him home. And we said, we talked to our doctor and, and she said, out of an abundance of caution, just go to an MRI. This is Friday night. Um, and we went and, uh, I remember sitting in the, um, you know, in the emergency room and I'm kind of eyeing the, the emergency room doctor, just kind of read his body language. And I could, it, we were sitting there, it took a while you could tell he was quite uh, upset about something or just seemed to be stressed. And, uh, this is about one o'clock in the morning. He kind of came over and I could tell he was, I could tell it instantly. And he asked to talk to me separately. And I knew that time something was not right. And, uh, so kind of looked, I looked over his shoulder an MRI. This first time I've ever looked at a MRI of a, a brain. And, um, but it was pretty clear there was some, <laughs> something very large there that shouldn't be there. Uh, so that was obviously a, just a terrifying moment. And, you know, one of the worst, the worst day of my life, uh, they had to transfer us to a, um, a different hospital, a neuro ICU. So we got in the ambulance at four o'clock in the morning. And of course, you know, Sean asked me, am I going to die? And, you know, you just, you don't, it, it was just a really, really terrifying moment. Um, again, the, the, it was an emergency room doc, but it, it clearly looked like, and I'm a lay person, but it, it appeared to be, you know, a cancerous tumor, um, that type of thing, but it looked quite severe. So you must have thought back at that point, how, how did this happen so quickly? Thinking back, was there any any clue prior that this was happening? Yeah, so we had actually, my wife and I, Lorraine, had spoken the, earlier that day um, that Sean had just seemed out of sorts. Um, we, um, we noticed he'd been dragging his left foot a little bit. Um, after the fact, we looked at his shoe tread and noticed that the yeah. left foot was just completely different. We kind of kicked ourselves for being parents and not noticing that. Um, over Thanksgiving, he dropped a plate, you know, uh, with our with our family, and he just been out of sorts. He kept losing his wallet, and just was just didn't seem to be himself. And and so we'd actually talked about maybe taking the doctor that following Monday if he didn't kind of snap out of it. We thought he would just be either being you know just grouchy or maybe fighting a virus or something. So um, in retrospect, obviously, then we realized that was the the cause of it. So the, the first diagnosis <clears throat> and what the doctors first thought was this was a glioblastoma multiforme, a very aggressive form of brain cancer. What went on from there? So, um, well, the next day after we were in this, the, the neuro uh, units, obviously I reached out to FA doctors that I knew and said, hey, have you ever heard anything? What's going on here? And um, we started kind of bringing them the conversation and the idea was we were going to do a biopsy uh, and then start thinking about what type of cancer treatment we could, we could do. And obviously any type of cancer treatment with an FA patient is, is really, really challenging. So what we decided to do was transferred NIH. We live in Richmond. It's about two hours up to Bethesda. Um, so to do a biopsy and that way they could um, get the material to various FA centers to do some analysis and, and figure that out. Um, so we transferred it to uh, NIH via hospital, which was interesting, I mean, via ambulance, which was very interesting. Uh, got there and then realized that um, we, NIH was, well, a different type of hospital, wasn't a, wasn't a treatment hospital. I was able to uh, contact uh, a number of friends that had a connection at Johns Hopkins with a, a renowned um, neurosurgeon there. We actually went and visited him and, and decided to ultimately go there. And met with him, uh, and that's where we did this, the, the biopsy to determine what this was. So, 
<clears throat> having somebody tell you that they're going to take a biopsy, take a piece of your child's brain, is a pretty disturbing thought. That must have been very hard. Yeah, and, and that was really the thing when we, we didn't know, this was all new to us. We'd spent 20 some odd years understanding the, in, the ins and outs of bone marrow transplants and all that stuff. This is completely, this is a new new field for us. So when someone says they're taking a, a, a brain biopsy, there's needle, but there's different types. And so as we learned about that and realized the just the inherent danger of taking a biopsy, a brain biopsy, regardless of what the results are, um, we realized we really wanted to be a place where we felt very, very comfortable, um, you know, w with doing that procedure. So um, that, you know, that, that procedure alone is, is dangerous, regardless of what you're trying to find. And how did the biopsy go? So that was, uh, you know, probably one of the most memorable days of my life. We spent, I think, five hours in the emergency room. Um, I actually had to go to the gift shop to get a new shirt because I had sweat through my shirt and a sweatshirt because I felt like I was in purgatory for five <laughs> hours uh, trying to, you know, what, what's going to happen. Um, you know, thankfully, Stella, you're part of the story because um, you had called me or contacted me literally the morning of taking Sean into the emergency room or to, to prepare him for the emergency room for the surgery. Um, in reference that you had another FA patient that had something that looked very similar to what Sean had. So that was the first sort of hope that maybe it was something that wasn't cancer. Um, so I had that in the back of my mind during the five hours of, of hell waiting to find the results. Um, and, but the, you know, the doctor came out and said the surgery went really well and that it's, you know, they, they do a test there. I guess the, the plan was to do a biopsy test during while he's under and if it comes back cancer so they're going to try to remove as much as they possibly safely could um but they, they came out it was not cancer so they, they did not remove much more uh so that was you know we were elated we couldn't believe it that we thought for sure we were battling cancer and it turns out we weren't so that was that was tremendous news yeah and then sean started some treatment after that Yes, so they put him on steroids to to reduce the inflammation, um, and he was, you know, obviously the, this is new territory, so the doctors didn't necessarily know what dosage, how long, so he was on a course of steroids through, um, I guess, February time frame. We went back, they tapered it. Um, he did then have a seizure in the April time frame, April, May time frame at school. He kind of fell over. Uh, we, so we kind of been back and forth on various levels of steroid trying to figure out, you know, what's appropriate to kind of get the inflammation down. And was Sean in good shape? Was he able to walk out of the hospital? He was able to walk out of the hospital. Um, he really after, in fact, he actually played in the final <clears throat> basketball game of the season and scored, which was really exciting. <laughs> um, he still, you know, his, his left foot was dragged a little bit, but he was able to run and, and participate in basketball. Um, subsequently, we've noticed that over time, his, his balance has, has degraded substantially. He has a difficult time um, walking on uneven terrain. Um, he's got a little, little bit of vision loss in his left eye. Um, and his, his left foot kind of drags a little bit. It, 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 varies, it varies slightly, and it's hard to tell day-to-day -day cha day -day changes. I do have video of him. I try to video him on a, on a regular basis to kind of look at different, um, how his gait changes and evolved over time. Um, but I think he would be hard pressed right now, um, you know, to play basketball like he did shortly thereafter. Um, I'm not sure if that's the steroids that, that, but we're yeah. just kind of a slower kind of degradation in his, in a little bit of his mobility. Yeah. But and right now he functions pretty well. I mean, in terms of walking around and stuff. Yes. And what did, what did he do last year? Where did he spend last year? So exciting. So yes, last fall, he uh, went to college. Uh, he went to a small school in Virginia called Ferrum College, and he helped manage the football team. He loves athlete, loves sports. Uh, and, uh, you know, did, had some of the normal struggles that, that college freshmen do, but, but got through it. And, uh, he, um, yeah, he's a, a soft, he's going to be a sophomore in a few weeks. Obviously COVID has changed things a bit and we're certainly, we're monitoring that closely, whether it's going to be online or in person, but, uh, but absolutely thrilled that he's in college. And if, you know, if he told me in, in, the, in the, the darkest hour in that emergency room, 
you know, that he don't worry, he'll, you know, well, worry, but he'll be in college a year and a half from now. I'd like, I, I wouldn't believe it. So we're, we're thrilled that he's in college. So the biopsy that we thought was going to show a malignant and aggressive cancer. So something, something bad, but something known showed inflammation that we think is, is something new and different and specific to FA. So that moves you away from something immediately bad, but leaves you with a lot of uncertainty. Um, how does it feel living with that uncertainty? Uh, obviously not great. Um, I mean, FA families are uniquely qualified, uniquely uh, yeah, qualified to deal with uncertainty. We deal with uncertainty in every, almost every aspect of our lives. So, um, you know, I, I wish we didn't have it, but it, you know, we, we've, we've lived with it for 20 some odd years. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's just something I never contemplated. I never thought of this being um, an issue that he would have to deal with in terms of uh, mobility, uh, in terms of balance. Uh, we worry about his cognitive. You know, we, we recognize sometimes he has some difficult time with memory and things like that. Um, and, you know, it'd be great if we could just, if I knew what the progression would be or, or if it would stop if, or if it would, you know, it's just so hard to know um, always with any, every, everyone, but certainly with FA individuals trying to project out five years from now, 10 years from now. Um, and uh, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's really rough not knowing, but again, we're, we're kind of used to that and uh, we're going to try to do everything we can to, to, um, to figure out what's going on here and, and try to find ways to, to help him and the others that are affected by it. Thank you for sharing with us, Kevin. We really appreciate it. Of course, absolutely. <laughs>